My name is Marcus Bühler. I'm a professor at MIT, and I'm excited to teach this course today to teach you all about chemistry and living materials and how we can understand matter in life. We call it the physics and chemistry of material music, and it's the intersection of materials and understanding materials through the sounds they make innately, intrinsically, or when we use materials as a way of building musical instruments, and the kind of design we can do not only in the material science space by drawing a material microstructure or maybe by uh, coming up with an amino acid sequence, but by actually using sound like playing a piano and designing a new protein from that. In fact, the overarching question for this module is, can we hear materials? Can we hear materials the way they are? Can we listen to them? And can we play a piano, for instance, a keyboard, to design entirely new proteins, entirely new materials through this process. I'm going to give you a brief outlook on what we're going to be learning in this module. So in the beginning, we're going to look again at, at hierarchical materials. We now know that they are universal in nature. We know that um, pretty much anything we see is made out of hierarchical structures, from the molecules all the way to the spider webs. And we're going to be thinking now a little bit differently about them and thinking about how do organisms actually construct them. So think about a spider. A spider will build a web not by according to a building plan, but we will build a web by interacting with the environment, constructing something, understanding what she has built, deciding on the next step, and this interaction of building something, measuring the environment, measuring the response, processing the information in the brain of the spider or the insect, and making new decisions based on what's already there, or what's missing, is what we're going to be thinking about. Um, we're also going to be thinking about vibrations. We're going to be looking at can we hear materials? I already posed that question in the beginning. Um, how do materials sound like? How can we use sound to characterize materials and maybe even model materials that way and design new materials? We're going to be taking a really deep dive on that. Um, also, we're going to be talking about the, um, the importance of, of vibrations in spider webs and how spiders use vibrations as a way of communicating not only with each other and with, um, with prey or detecting prey, but also as a way of detecting the environment because spiders are basically blind, so they need a way of understanding the environment through different signals, and vibrations is the one they use. Um, and we also want to think about the, um, the idea of constructing new hierarchical systems, maybe in sound, and then materializing them and building a material from sound that was designed completely in sound, and that's where we're going to be playing a piano to decide if we can actually make a new protein from that. Um, and um, we're going to end up the section by thinking about artificial intelligence. Can we instead of using a real spider brain or the human brain to create hierarchical systems, um, can we use artificial intelligence to replace the human brain or the brain <clears throat> of a spider in creating systems that are very complex in their construction but have very interesting functionalities, things that we haven't discovered yet, and can we use sort of artificial brains to do that job? Let's move on. And um, so one fundamental question I'd like, uh, like to ask at the beginning of this, of this uh, module is how are things built in engineering and in biology. And if you think about construction, uh, you probably think about construction cranes. And in fact, uh, that's usually how at least large-scale structures are built in engineering. We have a whole bunch of cranes. We build some scaffolding. And um, you know, with the scaffolding, we pour concrete, or we, we use the scaffolding to construct the building. And um, it's a very, uh, very involved process. It involves a lot of elements, like cranes, a lot of time, a lot of humans, a lot of machinery to do that. Now, in contrast, a structure like a building, a very complex structure, is built in nature using a very different paradigm. In fact, you think about a single spider, and obviously there, I think, they're really interesting, very beautiful, very integral structures, yet they're made in a very different paradigm. Spiders do not have scaffolds. Always the cells in our body don't have, don't have any scaffolding either. They, they interact through proteins, they interact through signals like mechanical stimulation and others, and they decide um, what kind of structures they need to build and how they need to repair themselves. So in fact, uh, to do that, to study this uh, in more detail and really understand how spiders, for instance, build things, we have um, um, a, um, a spider farm at MIT in our, in our laboratory where we, have, we use real spiders um, to have them build webs. And we watch them while they build the webs. And this is a, a collaborator, Tomas Saracino, um, and my former um, postdoc and research scientist, Zhao Jin. And uh, this is the moment where we received our first spiders and spider frames um, in which we're going to be building these, uh, these, these spider webs. And the way this looks like, um, this process really is holistic in the sense that we're exploring the whole life cycle of the spider interacting with the prey. We have the spider. 
and we have the food, the prey for the spider. And what happens during the construction of a web is the spider will eat the prey and um, it will um, digest it and it will make new protein. It will reorganize the, um, the prey that it has eaten and break it down into its elementary amino acid building blocks. And it will then recreate a new protein based on the DNA sequence to make different kinds of silks, for instance, and build a web. Yeah? And um, it's an amazing process. Um, here's some photos of some spiders. So this one here, um, quite a big one, actually. It's a couple of inches tall. Um, this one is a much smaller one, but also one that we have in our laboratory. Uh, yet then another one, it's called Tetirin sesophytes. Um, and what's interesting about this one is that some of these, um, most of the spiders that build webs are females, and the males play a very, um, very, uh, very insignificant role in the spider world. In fact, this male, for instance, of this species is only 1% of the size of the female, so very, very tiny. Um, and so most of the spiders we have, obviously, are females. Um, the males are usually killed or die after, after they mate. Um, and um, they build webs. And so here's a couple of other photos. Now, you might think about building webs. Um, how does it work? And in fact, um, this process itself can be harvested or can be explored. Uh, this is a study we've done a few years ago um, where we used a spider silk spinning duct. So this is sort of the, a macroscopic view of the spinning duct of a, of a spider. And um, this um, process here, we can see how we can pull all the spider silk threads and actually collect them, uh, like shown in this video, on a big spool. So here's the spider in there. You can see the spinning process. We can pull out the threads and we can collect the spider silk and we can then do experimentation with the spider silk, or we can make, we can 3D print the spider silk, or we can do all sorts of different things. And uh, this process obviously is one where we can really study the individual spider silk threads. We can also observe the spiders build webs in nature. So this is an example for a spider building a two-dimensional web, and you can kind of see the very intricate process by which the spider uh, pulls the existing threads, how it senses the vibrations, how it adds the new thread. You can kind of see how that, that weaving happens um, in forming these uh, beautiful web structures. And uh, what, you do, what we do is we usually have studied in the past, we've studied two-dimensional webs, and most recently uh, we have begun to look at three-dimensional webs, uh, which are, like I mentioned earlier, most spider silk species, spider species actually build three-dimensional webs. They don't build 2D webs. Uh, except, of course, most of the spider webs that you might see in, in, a, in, a, in a drawing or in a book are 2D webs. Most real spider webs are actually going to look more like this. And this is one of those spider webs built in a frame. This is uh, done in, in collaboration with our um, collaborator, Tomas Saracino, um, who has a very large collection of, of spiders, spider webs, uh, frames, and uh, we've been working with him in, in studying these and understanding the architecture of spider webs and how they construct that. So, um, I think I've convinced you that spiders are amazing architects. Right? They build incredible structures, just like just this picture here is um, a really nice illustration of the construction process, which is really intricate and interesting. This one here is the final product of a spider web, which we're going to learn much more about that in the course of this lecture. Um, very intricate structures. You can kind of see there's some internal structure. You can already make that out. You can see there's some filaments on the side, less dense regions, very dense regions. Um, there's regions in the web here that the spiders used to live in. Uh, there are regions where they store their prey, there's regions where they mate, they have offspring, um, and it's almost like a little house or structure. And there are even spy spider species called social spiders or semi-social spiders where they live together in colonies. So most spiders are territorial, meaning you can only have one spider in a, in a region, and they will fight it out and kill each other until there's only one left. Some spiders, however, are social spiders or semi-social spiders, so they build multiple webs that are nested, kind of like building a small village or a city of, of spider webs. So very inter interesting um, questions associated with that. And so the question we've been asking here is, how do they do it? How do the spiders build the webs? Um, how do they decide what to build? And how does the building actually work? And in fact, um, spider web construction, just like this one, this is the same movie you've seen a few minutes ago, is really an inspiration for 3D printing because 3D printing works exactly like that. Now, of course, um, which of these processes is more elegant? I think it's pretty obvious, right, that this one seems a lot more complex and elegant than this one. So this is a human 3D printer from the top. It's a side view of a 3D printer. And you can see we can build all sorts of different geometries, um, but um, it's very static, right? And if you, if you wanted to have a 3D printer build a spider web, like this particular printer would not be able to build a spider web because it's going to only print um, three-dimensional structures that are well connected. Um, so the spider has um, really a lot of things that it can do that we cannot yet do in engineering, uh, but it's an inspiration. So um, yeah, so the question we ask here is which one is more elegant, more versatile? 
uh, which can, can be programmed more easily, right? So if you want to create a different web structure, the spider, we cannot ask the spider to make a different web, but we can, of course, program the 3D printer directly and have the 3D printer make any kind of geometry we want it to make. So um, let's take a deeper look into one of those three-dimensional webs. And in fact, um, I've shown you the outside view of the 3D web. This is a, um, a view of the inside of this three-dimensional web. But you can kind of see here, this is a very intricate, very detailed uh, structure. And you can see there's a lot of structure in there. Even though from the outside, it looks very random. Um, there's actually a lot of detail in there. And you can see kind of like here, there's, a, there's almost like a ve very regular structure in the back, like a mesh structure, which actually is a tenth web that makes up part of the living area for the spider. Um, there's more loosely connected threads you can see on the side here. You can see very dense regions. This is actually close to where the spider is at this point. There's some holes in there, there's defects in there. And um, in fact, this is just a small section. So there's a lot of information in there, a lot of information in these webs. And they almost look like small pictures of universes, of um, filaments connected in space, masses becoming denser and denser, and forming more complex geometries that way. So how did you do it? So this is the spider. How did you actually construct webs like this? And to do to understand that, we uh, developed with Tomas uh, Saracino and others uh, in our lab. We connect. We developed a, um, a scanning technology, which basically looks like this. We have the spider living in a frame. You've seen that frame already in a few, few slides ago. Uh, and um, what you see is that um, the the spider will live in there. It will be put on a on a on a container of water, so the spider doesn't escape. Um, it will be stuck in there. We're going to feed it flies and food so it's happy and, and, and actually will begin to build webs. Um, actually, it builds um, denser webs more quickly if it's hungry, right? Because it needs the web to, to catch food. But if it has no food at all, it won't build any web because it needs energy to build the web. So there's a trade-off. But so we feed it enough to build a web um, and then we watch it doing that. And the way we watch the construction of the web, we use a sheet laser. The sheet laser will light up one section of the web at a time, one here, next one, next one, next one, and uh, we will take photos. So there's a camera here, there's a sheet laser, and we will slice the web into thousands and thousands of pieces, and we'll now have a stack of hundreds of thousands of different images, which each consist, each represent one slice of the spider web. And then we're trying to reconstruct a three-dimensional model from that. So discussion. So working with spiders in the laboratory is a delicate task. It's a lot of fun sometimes, very rewarding, but also sometimes surprising. So I want you to think about different scenarios of things you would like to do. If you were to spend a day in my laboratory at MIT and working with the spiders, what kind of experiment would you like to try? And why would you try that? And what are the kinds of things you would like to watch the spiders do? All right, so um, we have a whole team of students in my lab that work with the spiders. Um, actually started a couple of years ago with some um, undergraduate senior students who developed the first iteration of this spider scanning architecture, which we actually first model, we uh, worked on with, with Tomas in his lab. Um, we then created an, an iteration of that um, setup at MIT, and we had a whole group of, of capstone of senior design students working on a, on a first iteration of this model. Um, we then began to, to hire a couple of undergrad students, um, uh, Neosha and Marcos most recently, and we have a graduate student, Isabel, who, who does her PhD, is work, who's working on a PhD right now um, on three-dimensional spider webs and all the aspects around it. And uh, those, this group of students and others who helped have um, created the setup where we can do the scanning. I already mentioned we have sheet lasers to scan the web. Um, we have um, um, it darkened up kind of like a studio where we have, um, we can make sure there's no reflection from the side. We want to focus really only on the web structure that we light up. Um, and uh, we have a bunch of electronics. I'll talk maybe a little bit more about that later. Um, so we can automatically scan the web. And you can imagine spiders like to build webs at night when it's dark. They do sense day and night and they like to build webs at night. Um, and watching spiders build webs could take up to three or four days. And so in the early iteration, the students actually had to be in the lab for a couple of days to watch the spiders build the web, which is not very, um, that might not be a lot of fun to, to do, to be in the basement lab for a couple of days. Um, and so we created actually an automatic process by which we can then um, scan the webs. And we can actually now remotely scan the web. We can detect all the images, store the images, and you can imagine there's a lot of data. So practically, there's a lot of practical challenges with doing this because it produces many, many terabytes or petabytes of data by scanning the web over and over again to watch exactly what the spider does during construction. Um, and uh, actually, Niyosha in the summer and in the fall this year has done a lot of work on, in making that happen. And you kind of see what Niyosha has studied here. This is a, back, uh, a, a little web in the back that she has created. as one in the front. You can see the sheet laser lighting it up. Um, and this whole process 
results in the kinds of uh, movies and illustrations as one is here. So this is real data. And uh, this is the sheet laser kind of going through the web. And uh, you can see how as you go through the web, it lights up different sections. And you can see there's this dense region. You've seen that region before was it like a mesh-like structure. And you go through. And um, you can see how there's a lot of internal structure. Um, and um, this data now, these slices of images are used to reconstruct a three-dimensional model using mathematical equations. Kind of see how we get up in the other side. So a lot of details in there. Um, and uh, you know what that looks like, again, so there's the, the workflow of, this, of these experiments goes like this. We have the spider, the living spiders, and the frame. We feed them, and they build the web. And so this is the actual real web photograph. This is a, based on the sheet laser images. And then we construct a three-dimensional model of exactly this web that lives in a computer. And I'm going to show you in a moment why we need the web in a computer. Um, for one reason, we can do a lot of manipulation analysis in a computer. We can, we can analyze the data. Uh, we can transform the spider web into a musical instrument. Uh, you can already imagine this spider web has a lot of strings. And if you plug on a string, it makes a sound. And so one of the, one of the applications of this web is we've used this web to create a new kind of musical instrument where we can actually interact with the web not only by watching it and seeing it, but actually by using it as a musical instrument and understanding how to sound, what, is, what a web sounds like, and to explore the space that way. So this is why we have a 3D model. Um, and um, we can also, of course, do analysis of the stages of, of construction of the web by watching the spider build the web over, over a period of time. Uh, that's another view. Um, and you can very nicely see this is one of the earlier webs we have, uh, we have scanned. Uh, and uh, you can see that um, it has this really interesting tent structure in the middle here, right? That's a real web, and that's the model we've constructed in, 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 in a computer. And um, this um, reconstruction of the model is a very complicated process algorithmically, where we, we take the data, the slices, and you can see there's complications because the data doesn't come in, in pixels that are clear, right? So you can see there's a shade of color, different intensities. We translate into a grayscale image, ultimately into a binary image. We stack the images, and then we use an algorithm to reconstruct a three-dimensional connectivity. So this creates the actual model. The real model of the web, ultimately, uh, consists of nodes that are connected. And it, it tells us what nodes are connected to what other nodes. Right? And this is what defines the spider web geometry. So as a discussion, I'd like you to think about two things. Um, first of all, we, we have seen um, a lot of analysis now of reconstructing three-dimensional webs into a model. And we've done this by writing a MATLAB code to stack the images and create a three-dimensionally connected node model. And I want you to think about what kind of computer code have you written? Have you written any code? Uh, what's your favorite pro programming language? And what kind of projects have you worked on? And maybe if you need a new project, would you imagine maybe working on reconstructing a spider web from, from data like this? As we <clears throat> have kind of, kind of scanned many different webs, uh, one of the recent scans we've done here was the observing the spider constructing a web. And, in fact, this uh, movie here shows an, an illustration over the span of um, you know, a couple of days. So you see it go from 4 hours to 32, 47, 55, 70, 70 93. And you can see how slowly over this period of time um, the spider is building the web. You can see how she's moving around here. Right here is the spider in the corner here. Um, and that's the, the sort of thing that we can now understand using the scanning technology. So we can really begin for the first time observe the spider actually constructing the web in its natural habitat, meaning in darkness, um, without perturbing the spider and letting it really it, it's, it do its own its own thing, and uh, this is one of the results. So if you if you if you like the model and you like the images, I mean this is a, a, a three dimensional image, the, a model that we can we can we can look at. We can actually make a movie like this and, and explore that. Um, and I'll show you later. We can also use virtual reality where you can actually go inside a spider web and kind of like going inside a computer game, and you can begin to actually see the spider web and and, and insert yourself into it. Uh, and you can see how a lot of the details are captured very nicely in this, in, this, in this model. So let's think about what we can do with the spider web and imagining and looking at all these different strings and thinking about each of these strings might be a string like we find in a guitar or violin. And um, again, if you think about musical instruments like this guitar, and you can hear in the background how the guitar sounds like, the sound of this guitar really comes from plucking these strings and exciting vibrations in the string. This is a slow motion of, of an instrument like this. And you can see how the string vibrates. And these vibrations will transform into sound waves that we can hear and pick up with our ears. So uh, let's move on and um, think about vibrations and waves. So vibrations and waves can be fundamentally described 
um, by sine functions. And you can see this here, you know, you have this, um, this circle and as you go around the circle, you create this representation of a sine wave. And this idea of having continuous vibrations, harmonic vibrations is something that we see in many different instances. In fact, um, we can represent any kind of sound, any kind of noise, any kind of audio as a collection of sine waves. And typically, we use um, a collection of different frequencies of sine waves that are played at different volumes. And for instance, we can describe a square wave like this. This is a square wave. It goes up, same, constant down again. Um, we can describe that particular wave as a collection of sine waves. So sine waves are sort of the elementary building blocks of sound, just like we're thinking about proteins. And in proteins, amino acids are the fundamental building blocks of any protein material. And um, you can actually think about in that spirit, you can think about how a sine wave um, might be uh, used to compose the very particular characteristic sound of different instruments like a violin or piano. And uh, you can even build models actually of how these plucked strings, like this is a string that's being plucked in a piano, how that particular vibrational spectrum emerges from the physics of the string being vi vibrating. And these kinds of models can be used to describe sound in this way. And again, sound really in instruments is a collection of frequencies, overlapping frequencies. Not just a single frequency, but collection of many different frequencies at different volumes, as you can see here. And that's what distinguishes one instrument from another. So if we're thinking about the, the spider web again, so again, this is another view of the spider web. You can see that there's not only one string or six strings like in a, like in a guitar. Um, we're going to have thousands, hundreds of thousands of strings in there, and each of them are going to vibrate with a certain frequency, and they're going to follow some physical laws. And what we've done in this, um, in this work, we've tried to find a way of taking the data from the spider web and sonifying it, making it audible, by simulating the vibrations of, this, of, the, of, the, of the threads of silk in the spider web and, and, and visualizing them. And what you see on the slide and what you can hear in the background is the sound that the spider web produces as you traverse through the web, we're going to actually be picking up the vibrational soundings of whatever we see, right? So you can see as we, we're going to go through the web, you've seen that movie before in a different format. Uh, you can see on the, on the bottom, the, on the left, uh, the bottom on the right, you can see um, where we are in the web, in the model. And what you hear in the background is the sound produced as we go through the web. So this kind of sound obviously sounds very different from any of the musical instruments you might have heard and you conventionally use. So one other thing we can do, um, since we have a model, is we can actually begin to use virtual reality to enter the web. And what you see in this movie now coming up, and you can hear in the background the sound that you can make by interacting with this, with the spider web. We've built a model that where you can actually explore different musical theories, different musical ways of expressing the web, and you can begin to kind of in this virtual reality enter the web and explore the web and hear how it sounds like um, and, and explore this structure in a way you could never do in real life because of course the web is only a couple of feet by a couple of feet and there would be no way uh, for you to go inside a web because you're too big, right? And you might be scared of the web as well, right? So you, you wouldn't fit in there and you might not want to go in there. Uh, but in the virtual reality setup, you can do that and you can explore it. So one of the, one of the ways we've explored this, this new musical instrument we've built from the spider web, we've had a couple of shows where we have used this interactive spider web instrument and played in front of live, played live performance in front of audiences. We've had a show in Paris uh, with Thomas Saracino in, in his exhibition um, at Palais de Tokyo. We've had a couple of shows at MIT. Um, and you can kind of see how that looked like. We had a, a giant model of the spider web on the stage. And we have been playing the spider web um, by exploring different regions of the spider web. And we projected the regions we've explored, we've plucked the strings off on the corners of the spider web and kind of see how it's an overlay of different hierarchical structures inside the web, the actual spider silk, and on the outside, the projections of what we can hear. Um, and this is another view where you can see that. And uh, you can actually see in the performance, this is my, my graduate student, Isabel, who plays the spider web. She sits inside the cube, uh, playing the web, and the audience on the outside can hear and see what she's doing and how she's interacting with the web. So now let's do a little bit of an experiment and um, I want you to watch a video. And it's a video of a piece called Tangled Web where we explore the soundings and the inner structure of a web. And the captions in the video give you a lot of additional information and detail into how the sound was created and um, what you can hear.
All right. So another way, another way we've used the musical instrument is we have um, thought about building a model in music of what the spider does when it eats the fly and it breaks the fly into its molecular building blocks, creates new amino acids, new amino acid sequences through the DNA sequence, the language, it creates new, new proteins and builds a new web from that. We have used the sound that we have created from the spider web and used the audio as a basis to create new sounds by taking pieces of the sound and reassembling them into a new structure. And this is one way by which we are trying to design new things through audio. The audio corresponds to a particular physical structure, in this case the web, and by reassembling the audio, by composing new audio, new music from the web, we can begin to design a new material that we can then again close the loop and think about new ways of how we can design a protein. And we're going to be talking much more about that process of designing and closing the loop in the next section of this module. So discussion. So if you listen carefully to the pieces you've heard, both the Tangled Web movie and also the last slide where we used granular synthesis to create new sound from the spider web, um, you notice the change from more chaotic sounding of the web to a more organized musical structure. And I want you to think about why that happens and what it means and how it relates to the kind of musical experiences you might have had by listening to conventional music or playing your own musical instrument. Now let's do a little case study and think about can we play the piano to design a new protein? This is a big question, right? So imagine um, wanting to design a protein. We've actually not really talked about designing proteins, but the proteins are usually designed through evolutionary principles. They have random mutations, and the proteins that are successful survive. The ones that aren't successful, they don't survive. And this process is a natural selection process by which the best performing protein materials and proteins are selected to be used in organisms over and over again. So the question is, can we use sound um, as a way of designing new proteins or new materials in general? And the way I like to introduce this idea is the following. So all the things we've talked about so far in modules one, two, and three was to use a material and to think about atoms, placing the atoms, and organizing the atoms, organizing amino acids, and designing materials like Lego pieces. We've invoked Lego a couple of times, and this is a great model for materials because we have building blocks and we can put the building blocks together in different ways, and this is what creates different kinds of materials. But can we do something different? Can we go and transform materials into sound? And we've already seen how we can translate a spider web into sound through its vibrations. And can we then, in the sound space, design something new? You can imagine that um, the spider web, you've heard a couple of examples of spider web soundings, and you've heard that they have many different kinds of harmonic and unharmonic content. And if you draw the waveforms and you think about what these waveforms really look like, they're going to look like sine waves in the simplest case as a building block. But because the structure is so complex, the resulting sine waves um, overlay of sine waves form all sorts of different kind of libraries of, 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 of waveforms. So we can use those waveforms, just like we've used the Lego blocks here, and create something new. And that's what we do in musical composition. We use different components, different building blocks, and we put them together in new ways. So imagine this is your tone library, and you can imagine this being assigned to a key, to a pi to a key on a piano. Can you play those in a certain order and design a material that way? So not by designing the physical geometry of the Lego blocks, by designing a sequence of notes and then translating that back into a material. And in fact, actually, this is a really a broad and, and universally applicable idea because if you, if you think about it, vibrations and sound and waves are universal to many descriptions of matter. In fact, at a quantum mechanical scale, we have the wave-particle duality which basically uh, talks about the equivalence of a particle as a wave and a particle. Um, we have sound, of course, which are acoustic waves, things you can hear. We've heard a couple of examples already. We've seen the guitar string vibrating, causing um, sound wave pressure waves in air coming to our ears, um, being transmitted to our brain, and we can process the information that way. And of course, spiders use vibrations as a key tool in understanding what they've built and what else they need to build, and also to catch prey, to, to sense prey, to communicate with other spiders. So vibrations and sound are very universal, and, and again, we can think about using this very elementary description of a sound wave to, um, to come up with um, um, a description based on the mathematics of sine functions to overlay many different sine functions to describe almost any material, any phenomena, any spectrum. And um, there's another angle to this description of sound, music, and materials, and that's the following. So what you hear in the background is um, some conventional classical music, and you can actually hear um, different instruments playing together. And the way I like to think about construction of music is the following way. We have elementary 
description are sine waves, which we have heard a lot about, and we overlay the sound, sine waves in a certain way to create the sound or timbre of an instrument. That's how instruments are different, right? They have different number of sine waves overlaid on top of each other. We can modulate the sine waves. So for a piano and a guitar, the volume is very high in the beginning and it drops off very quickly. If you play a string, an elongated string sound, the volume is very high over a very extended period of time. So the modulation of volume of the pitch over time is another element by which the hierarchy, the structure of sound is shaped to create different instruments. Um, then we have different melodies. We can play different tones, we can play chords, we can play melodies. And finally, especially in classical music, you have many different instruments playing sometimes the same, sometimes different, sometimes very different melodies and harmonies. And that collection of different ideas gives rise to a very complex musical piece. And similarly to what we see in music, in the way we're thinking about construction of music, we can say the same thing about materials, right? So in materials, we're beginning with elementary building blocks of DNA, DNA information. We have amino acids that are encoded by DNA. You've already seen a version of this graph before. Uh, we can build universal structures like secondary structures, um, primary, primary sequences turning secondary structures like alpha helices, beta sheet structures. We have nanocomposite structures. We have filaments. We have bundles of filaments. And this goes back to, you know, we had seen the internal structure of a spider web, but we had seen the inside of a spider web actually looks like that, right? And so if it goes through all these hierarchies in a very similar way to music in materials, we design materials by modulating, by changing different scales, right? We, can, we might change the amino acid sequence, we might change the way the secondary structure looks like, we might change the way the microstructure looks like, and ultimately the web geometry itself as well might be changed. And in a way, materials and music have a direct analogy in the way they're constructed. And um, similar to the materials, you've seen in materials the idea of universality is abundant. We've seen that alpha helices and beta sheets and the idea of fractures came up many, many times during the last couple of modules. Similarly, in music, we have ideas that are happen over and over again. And so you can kind of see that if you look at a musical score. This is a Beethoven piece where you can see that certain types of patterns of rhythms, of, of notes played, appear again and again in this music. And this universality in building blocks and putting these building blocks together in different orders at different time scales, different length scales, different hierarchy structures is very similar, again, to the things we've seen in materials throughout the first three modules. And in fact, um, recently, um, we and other labs around the world have began to think about constructing music, understanding music in that way, using mathematical models, using, for instance, category theory, where we can describe very elementary descriptions of how not the actual physical building block works, but how the interaction between building blocks works and how we can define the relationships and how relationships between building blocks will create certain function. One function in music might be harmony, might be a certain, uh, a, a certain uh, modality of music. In materials, the functionality might be strength or toughness or resiliency. And all of these functionalities we might measure, whether in music or whether in materials, have at its origin very similar patterns that can be translated from one to another. So in addition to designing a material through sound, there actually are universal mechanisms, patterns, that we can discover, for instance, in music and apply in the design of new materials, and vice versa. We can use materials to design new music, and we've already seen that in the spider web. We've used the spider web to inspire new ways of composing music by going sort of from the material world through the vibrations into the musical world and, and opening a whole new direction of musical composition. And uh, for example, using these kind of, the way you can understand elementary transactional mechanisms in musical composition, instead of writing music as a score, so this is sort of looking at a material, an equivalent to a material, you're looking at a material as an actual physical object and studying it, you can also describe a material transactional and say, the way this material behaves is because of X, Y, Z. It's because there's an alpha helix in there. It's because the alpha helix acts like a spring. Because you have an assembly of alpha helices, you get a crack, and the crack will not extend because it changes shape. Um, so those are the transactional mechanism, mechanistic understanding of how materials behave. In a similar way, we can write music like this. And so actually, this, is, uh, 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 this um, sequence from a back piece written in this transactional mechanism, you can see we don't actually need the real notes. We only need the relationship between musical ideas and concepts to describe what is actually being created and played here. Uh, and this is very powerful, especially once we take a step back. Um, we're going to take a step back now and think about 
how is music created? How is art created, like paintings and drawings? Um, and how are spiders building webs? And what you actually see in this is that there's a very important element that I invoked, and that is that there's a neural network. The spider will sense vibrations, it will use the information sensed from vibrations in deciding on what to do next. And similarly, the human, when the human uh, makes a painting, um, he or she will uh, take a brush, or maybe this is an old uh, cave painting, um, where we will see something, understand something, have an impression, and then try to create a drawing, a representation of whatever we've seen, or tell a story, uh, or in music, it's a more abstract representation of ideas, and we'll recreate that. But it's processed through our brain. We, we have information, we have an experience, and we process the information, and we create something new. And we do that, the spider does it, and now with the advances in computer science, we can also let artificial neural networks do the same thing. And actually what you hear in the background now is um, a little bit of audio that's a synthetically generated piano concert that was based, based on a training an artificial neural network based on existing piano plays and uh, letting it create a new type of composition just by listening to the existing ones that are created by humans. So let's think about other ways by which we can utilize vibrations in nature and to think about building a model or maybe creating new materials through the vibrational models. And I wanna um, uh, show you a couple of examples of how through human history, we have, chemists have been able, have been imagining a molecule called benzene. Benzene is a ring-like structure, a uh, very, very prominent chemical structure, and it's been studied for hundreds of years. And so in fact, in 1867, um, people thought benzene looked somewhat like this. And then if you go through the textbooks over the years, you can see how it changed its geometry. And today the model, the most accurate model, is this one here on the right-hand side. But what these models are all getting wrong, if you open a textbook, is that molecules actually aren't static. And you can imagine, if you were to run a simulation of this um, the structure, it wouldn't look like that. In fact, it would be looking more like this. It would move around all the time. Molecules always move around because they have kinetic energy. Unless we're at zero temperature and everything's become static, at any finite temperature, you're gonna have a finite vibration of and motion of every atom in the system. And that's really how it should look like. So the textbooks really shouldn't be drawing a picture, a static picture, it really should be drawing something like this. And you can see here that um, this molecule has a particular way of vibrating, just like the string in the guitar. So thinking back about that string, and you can again hear the sound the guitar makes, uh, you can see that um, these strings vibrate, and they vibrate according to the laws of physics by plucking a string. Uh, in a similar way, this molecule vibrates. Now the difference is that this, these, these, these molecular vibrations do not follow necessarily classical Newtonian mechanics, they follow the laws of quantum chemistry. But we have a way of describing the motions of molecules by using molecular dynamics, so we can compute the vibrational spectrum. So what we've done is um, we've thought about that problem and again use this idea of thinking about breaking down the vibrations that these molecules have into their sine waves, so those elementary harmonic waves. And just like you've seen that picture before, we can, we can use the sine waves to describe any, any number of different waveforms and shapes, including the, the kind of waveforms you might see in a, um, in a particular uh, molecule. And uh, what we've done is we went and we calculated the vibrational spectrum of all known proteins to date. And um, there are a couple hundred thousand proteins that are known today in terms of structure. Uh, and they're deposited in a, in, a in a database called the Protein Data Bank. This Protein Data Bank has the geometry and the, the XYZ, the coordinates of XYZ of every atom of any protein known in them. And we can download them, and we can do a molecular dynamic simulation of all of them. And this is kind of like how it looks like for one example. You can see a protein itself will not be static. In fact, it will continuously vibrate. And you can see how different parts of the protein vibrate and, um, and have certain frequencies associated with them. And we've developed an algorithm where we, we download automatically every protein known from the protein data bank, the PDB. We then do a quantum mechanical chemical simulation to simulate the vibrations. And we collect these vibrations and we basically write down all the different, we call them modes, the vibrations according to the sine wave. Sine wave one, two, three, four, five, each vibrating at a certain frequency. And the overlay of all these different sine waves is what makes the particular sound of a, of a protein molecule. And we can make that audible. So um, we've done that, and you can kind of see how these different modes look like. So a, in, a, in a given protein, you can see that each, um, each mode is a particular unique vibration of the protein, and the collection of all these modes is what makes, gives a unique description of each protein, and we can translate it into audible sound. In fact, we found actually that the uh, representing molecules in the sound space or in the vibrational space is a unique way of describing them. 
Uh, just like giving them another label, just like saying, um, drawing a picture or giving them a name, um, we can recognize them just by looking at the sound spectrum. We don't need any other information. So we can sort of think about this. Uh, quantum mechanics gives us the, the tools to describe the vibrational spectrum. And each building block of matter, in this case, we're showing the, the vibrational spectrum the frequencies of the naturally occurring 20 amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, have a very unique sound associated with them. So this gives us an opportunity to not only go and, and create a model of a protein in sound space, but also to go from sound back into protein. So we can analyze existing sound and ask the question, what kind of sound spectrum do we have in that particular sound that we hear, and what kind of amino acid would that reflect? And we can go back and build a material from that information. So the way we did that is uh, using a trick called transpositional equivalence. And to illustrate what that means, I'm going to go through a little, little experiment. So as you are listening to the slide and listening to me in the slide, you're going to hear some sound in the background. And I want you to listen very carefully and think about what you hear. And what point do you recognize what melody is playing? I'm going to give you a hint. The melody you're going to hear is very famous. I'm sure you're going to know it. Uh, but you're not going to recognize it right away. It's going to take you a while until your ears can pick up the melody that's playing. So listen very carefully and see what's playing. And when you pick it up, write it down. So now that you've all heard it, um, you've all heard that this is for Elise from Beethoven. And um, the reason why you haven't recognized it in the beginning right away is because in the beginning I played it on a piano that has a very, very big keyboard and it plays very, very high frequencies. Frequencies that are so high your ears cannot pick them up. And in fact, uh, in the beginning I played it so high that yeah, you couldn't hear it. Uh, but I played the same melody and I, as time went on in this, in this piece, we've successively lowered the frequencies and kind of moved from the right side of the keyboard, a very, very big keyboard on the right, all the way to the left. And at some point, you're gonna get into the range of audible frequencies that your ears can actually pick up, around below 20 kilohertz and lower. And at some point, you can recognize. And what's Im important about this is that the melody that you recognize that it's for Elise doesn't matter, doesn't depend on the, on the key where you start from. It only depends on the relationship between the different sounds that you hear. Um, and um, this is very important when we think about building models of proteins because the vibrations in proteins are very high frequency. Our ears cannot naturally pick them up. And the way we make them audible is we transpose them. Just like in a piano piece, we can transpose the piano from very high frequencies, very, very, all the way to the right of the keyboard to lower and lower frequencies, we can hear them. In the same way, we can transpose the frequency, the vibrations in a protein also to a point where we can hear them. And the way we keep them consistent, we keep them meaningful, is that we keep the ratios of frequencies identical. Just like in this piece, the way a foilese works is because of the relationship between tones and rhythm. And it doesn't matter where you play it on a piano, you'll always recognize that it's foilese. It doesn't matter where you start. You start here or here or here. Uh, and um, that's the same for proteins. We can transpose proteins in audible frequencies and hear them. And we've done this for um, proteins in different ways. We have um, found models to describe the DNA sequence, the amino acid sequence, and the protein structure itself, and we can make them audible. And what you hear in the background here is um, the sound of one of these proteins. It's called a 104M. 104M is the code of the protein in the protein data bank. Each protein has a code in there, and 104M is a myoglobin protein. It's found in the muscle tissue of mammals, and the sound you hear in the background is the vibrational spectrum of this protein. And we have developed a little app that allows us to, um, just like in the spider web, this is a musical instrument where we can begin to explore the different soundings and explore the, the, the protein sounds from different angles and hear them and use them in musical composition. And one other thing you can do with this tool, in addition to listening to the proteins, you can actually build models of proteins in the audible space and you can write, for instance, you can translate a protein like this, this is lysozyme, you can translate this protein um, through its structure into a, a spectrum of frequencies. So this is sort of a snapshot of the entire protein played in musical space and you can translate this entire structure into a musical score, which is shown on the right hand side. 
Um, and um, one difference, of course, to conventional musical scores is that, again, just like in the spider web, the protein is not tuned according to the Western traditional tuning system. It vibrates according to the, its own laws of physics and chemistry, usually quantum mechanics. Um, but you can still imagine each of the amino acids having its own key on the keyboard, except that the keyboard isn't tuned to the conventional tuning, but it sounds different and actually sounds the way the proteins sound like naturally. And uh, one of the things you can do with that also, you can begin to look at diseases. And uh, what you can look at here is, um, what you look at here is a protein called elastin. And it's a protein we have recently folded using molecular dynamics simulations. Um, we have folded that protein. This protein is a very important protein in the human lung, also in the heart tissue, in blood vessels. It's a very important protein for, for, for us. And it's a protein that is associated with a lot of genetic diseases and other diseases. And so what we've done is, we've asked the question, can we listen to disease? So if you have a protein that's healthy, how does it sound like? And how does a protein sound like that has a mutation associated with a disease? And, and that's what we've, we've explored that here. So what you hear in the background are four notes. And this is sort of imagining taking a piano and assigning each of these protein mutations to one of the keys on the piano. Uh, the first one, the first key on a piano is the wild type, meaning the healthy protein, the way we find it in nature. Um, mutation one is the first mutation associated with a disease. Mutation two is the second mutation, and mutation three is the third mutation. And what you hear playing in the background is a, a successive playing of these four notes, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, but five it repeats itself. So you're going to hear that each of these mutations sound unique, and again, we can design we can assign each of these sounds on a key on a piano, for instance. And then we have done an experiment with this idea in asking, can we have a human viola player, um, somebody who has never heard about proteins or maybe played with proteins, can that person interact with the sounds of a protein? And the way this kind of looks like is like, this is like a virtual orchestra where we have um, the four different proteins playing melodies according to their own laws of tuning. And then you have a human viola player who has a viola tuned to a conventional Western tuning system. And the experiment you hear in the background is how a human viola player is trying to interact in the music space with these mutations of protein. So now we're coming to the overarching question of this, of this module. Can we play the piano to design a new protein? Right? And so to answer that question, we're going to have to think a little more deeply about what makes proteins unique. And proteins really are unique because they have an amino acid sequence, which defines their secondary structure, which defines ultimately their function through their folded geometry. So what if we could create a new kind of piano, a new kind of um, situation, and actually this um, we have encoded that not in a, um, in a piano, but in an app that you can download on, on Google App Store for free. And if you, if you download that, you're going to get on your phone a keyboard um, that has 20 keys. So this is sort of imagining like having a piano with 20 keys. Each key on the piano is one amino acid. And you can play that. And actually, as you play with that, you can hear the sound in the background, um, but you can also download the app and play with it. Each time you hit a key, you're going to hear a certain sound. That sound reflects that amino acid sonically that you have just created or, or played. And as you go along and you get practice with that, you can design, you can play the keys just like you would design, play on a piano, compose a new melody. You can now compose a new melody in the musical space of proteins, and that you can translate using the app back into an amino acid sequence, which then you can explore structurally. And one of the examples of the one that you have actually heard in the background playing when I, when I was trying the app here, I have designed this protein using the sound you've just heard. And the way this works is you can translate back um, the keys you've hit in, in a certain succession, and you can come up with a protein sequence from that, which the app calculates, and then you can either make the protein in a laboratory, or you can um, or you can, you can fold in a computer simulation and you can that way invent entirely new proteins of playing a piano. So um, one of the challenges with this is um, protein music is complex. I mean, you've heard a couple of examples and 
It's complex because it doesn't actually follow any of the traditional music theoretical concepts. It doesn't follow any of the cultural experiences most of us had. And it sounds strange. It sounds very odd. It sounds like from another world, from another world, which is interesting if you give, if you have ideas of creating new kind of art, new kind of music, but it's very difficult to have musicians use this kind of protein instrument or the spider web instrument designing new materials because all of our information, all of our training is based on conventionally tuned musical instruments. We don't, we're not used to playing these kinds of instruments and designing new structures from that. So one way of actually avoiding this, the history of knowledge of erasing the memory we have is to build, you might have guessed it, an artificial neural network. And that way we can basically let computers learn the language, the soundings of proteins from scratch. In other words, we have a huge database in the, in, out there where we have structures of thousands, hundreds of thousands of proteins. We can, we can hear them, we can listen to them. Can we have a computer learn the patterns of how these, these new types of musical compositions sound like and let computers create new protein sounds from that experience? And that's very difficult for us. So we use neural networks for that. And uh, one way you can use neural networks is to use them on traditional conventional music. And I want to illustrate one example for you. You get an idea of how that looks like for conventional music. So what we can do, we can feed a neural network songs, hundreds of thousands of songs that have been published and used in, 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 in the current popular culture, Western classical music, pop songs, you name it. You can get a huge database and feed many different kinds of melodies into a neural network and train the neural network to understand the patterns. And neural networks can then continue melodies or come up with new melodies based on what they've learned. This is exactly the same thing that you do when you write music. Uh, you begin with an idea and the idea will evolve and it evolves based on all the training, all the information you've had before and you come up with new ideas. But the patterns you use are usually based on these universal building blocks, just like we've seen in the Bach example, a Beethoven example. There are patterns and ideas that are used repeatedly all over again in music theory, the harmonic ideas, the scales, the tunings, and all these things. And those are the experiences we have as composers. Now, if you're dealing with um, computers, they need to learn. So basically, computers need to go to school, and they need to listen to a lot of songs, and then they can do the same job. And then I'll show you how impressive this can be for conventional music. This has nothing to do with proteins. This is just looking at conventional music and how computers can actually compose new music. So now we're going to listen to some examples of what computers that are trained based on conventional music can actually produce and what kind of compositions they can create. So in the beginning, we're going to listen to this piece here. This is the original. This is a little idea that I played on a piano. And you can listen to that. That's the origin. That's a human created composition. And you can listen to that. And it's actually repeated twice. That's why I put two A's here, two ideas, um, the same idea, basically A and A repeated twice. And now I fed this idea, this melody A, in a computer, and I let the computer come up with an idea of a variation of this idea of A, creating a new piece, we call it B. And what you hear in this piece, when we click on this one here, you're going to hear a second audio that is a combination of A. We're going to play this idea again in the beginning, so we're going to start with the initial idea A. And then part B, you're going to hear that sounds very different, is what the computer has actually come up with and generated. And um, then we're going to end up with A again. We're going to play A again. So the structure of this song is going to be A, B, A. And the previous one was just A and A. And you can listen to them again. Um, we're going to listen again to A, A in the beginning. That's the initial seed we've provided. And now you're going to hear the second part B, which has been generated by the neural network. And we're going to end with part A again. So now I have a little um, assignment for you. If you play a musical instrument, uh, I would like you to try to play this, this piece. This is the score of the ABA piece, which includes A, the initial idea that I've created, and B, the idea that the computer has generated based on the idea, and then A again at the end um, to, to circle back to what the initial idea was. And you can play that, try to play that, and um, identify in the score what was A, what is B, and what is A again. So, this idea of using neural networks to train, to train neural networks to learn the language of music is something that works really well. You've heard the example, um, 
it's incredible. You wouldn't have guessed maybe that a computer has generated a composition, but it has. And it's been doing that by learning many, many different songs and coming up with ideas of, of based on those songs and coming up with new kinds of musical structure. Now, what we've been trying to do now is to say, can we apply this to protein music? And in other words, we have a representation of proteins. We've talked a lot about that already. We have the ability to translate amino acid sequence into an expression of music that is based on all these proteins. There are hundreds of thousands of structures we have. We have hundreds of thousands, many, many hundreds of hours of music of that, are, that is based on proteins. It doesn't sound very pretty. I know we had the discussion earlier whether it's pleasant or not, but it is different, and it's a sound that, that proteins make. And we can learn that, and we can then ask the computer simulation, the artificial neural network, to come up with a new protein. Just like before, we have created a new composition based on an initial idea that we've provided. Can we provide a new protein based on a natural existing sequence? So basically repeating what evolution does all the time, and coming up with new protein designs. And in fact, it works really well. So what you see here is a little seed. So this is this seed of the protein is an existing protein we found in the protein data bank. And it's kind of like me playing in the beginning earlier, playing the simple melody on a keyboard and uh, feeding it in the computer and letting the computer create a more complicated piece from that. And same thing here, we have an uh, initial seed that we have from an existing protein. And the computer actually generates a whole new musical score which we can translate back into the amino acid sequence, just like I've alluded to before. We've already discussed the, the uniqueness of, of the tones and being able to translate the sound back into amino acids. And we can then look at this protein, and we've done this already with the app, right, where we have played. We have played protein music on the app, which is a sort of a piano, right, and created new proteins. And we can do the same thing here. We can have a much more complicated piece here, and we can actually design the type of proteins we like. In this case, we want to design an alpha helical protein. And it turns out, actually, the protein we've made is, in fact, an alpha helical protein. Now, this protein that a computer has generated through the neural network, through sound, through music, does not exist in nature. In other words, nature through evolution has not identified, found this protein yet. It's a protein that has never existed before, but it was discovered through music and then translating music back into protein. So we've designed new proteins by creating new music and translating the music back into protein design. And we can actually repeat that um, in very high abundance. We can make many different proteins. So this is a snapshot of, for example, of four different proteins we've designed completely from scratch using music. And one of the applications we're using this for is to design uh, coatings of proteins around food. Um, if you think about food, um, food is a very perishable structure. And together with my colleague, Benedetta Morelli, who is an expert in food security and, um, and, and shelf life enhancement of food, we're interested in designing new kinds of protein that nature has not yet invented that allow us to increase the shelf life of food by putting proteins around, for example, strawberries. So this is an application for this. And uh, you can see that these proteins actually um, um, are, are stable. They can be made, uh, they can be simulated. And um, you can kind of see how um, we can introduce some very interesting new variations of proteins, just like you can imagine uh, taking um, an existing musical idea and evolving it. Uh, in this case, we can take a protein that's found uh, in a human, and we can we can evolve this protein into very complicated structures that don't exist yet, and we can even make them in the laboratory. Right? We can take the sequence, insert the sequence as a DNA code into a bacteria, and the bacteria will make that protein and actually produce little tubes with this particular protein. We call them sequence A, which is the sequence that we've designed here. And this sequence, like the other ones, has not existed in nature yet. So this is the first time a protein has been designed, a material has been designed uh, through music, and actually made back into physical substance after it's been made through sound. And um, another way of using these proteins, of course, is more in an artistic way. You can imagine that if you have many different proteins or many different spider webs, many different ideas like this, uh, you can try to begin to assemble orchestras that aren't based on violins and, and, and other kind of conventional instruments, but they're based on solely proteins. So there's a couple of examples that you can find on, on, on the SoundCloud side. Uh, we have collected a lot of different compositions that we've made using different proteins. The one you hear in the background here is a composition that uses only protein sounds. So all you hear are sounds made by proteins, but to get different sounds for like reflecting different instruments, we use in a variety of different proteins. So for instance, we use uh, this protein called 6CJC, uh, which is a reductase protein and flavoenzyme. Um, it's a, a protein involved in the biosynthesis of steroid hormones. We have um, used as another protein in this orchestra an AI-generated protein. So one of the proteins we've made synthetically, you've heard before. Um, that's one of the proteins playing in this orchestra. 
And we've also used this um, enzyme called lysozyme, which you've seen a couple of photos actually during the modules. Uh, this makes a particular sound as well. And so what you hear in the background is uh, music that's solely created, generated by just these protein sounds. Part of that question, we're going to think about where does harmony actually come from? And the reason why uh, conventional musical instruments, if they're tuned well, um, sound nice to our ears is because strings, as we have it in a guitar, um, vibrate according to certain patterns. And the way we understand music, at least uh, Western classical music traditionally, is we're using a particular set of strings with certain lengths and certain tensions and we're tuning the strings with respect to each other so that all the strings are multiples of the frequencies that we have in the first place, in the lowest sounding string. And that consistency, that matching of these frequencies in these nodes of vibrations gives us the typical pleasant experience of what we usually associate with harmony. Um, and um, so in fact, if you think about, um, if you can read this, um, uh, these are different notes in a musical score, and you can see that each note um, is a multiple of a frequency in the set of frequencies that are allowed. So there's a discrete set of frequencies that are allowed, and when we tune musical instruments, we tune them so that we can only hear those multiple frequencies that make sense to our ears and that create what we call harmony. In the spider web, this does not apply, because the spider web, obviously, it's constructed naturally by the spider. It doesn't know about tuning. The length of the spider threads Silk threads are very different. They do not match any of this music theoretical concepts that we have in conventional music. And that's why the spider web sounds so different because its silk threads do not follow this tuning system. They do not follow those rules and those, those laws that we use in conventional music theory. So, um, so let's have some discussion. So we've learned that the spider does not follow the traditional tuning because the spider silk threads are all different lengths, all different tensions, and they're not tuned like we're tuning a guitar or piano. So the sounding of the spider web is very different. It sounds very different from a piano or guitar. And the question is, is it still pleasant? If you listen to it, can you find this to be a pleasant listening experience? And also, if you're listening to the spider web, and if you've never heard any other music, if you only have heard, had heard spiderweb music in your life, would then listening to conventional music the way we know it today, would that sound strange to your ears? Another question at the end I want to pose is, if you have a way of sonifying information, materials information like proteins, how would a singularity sound like? And how would a fracture sound like if you were to use the analytical solution of a stress field, a singularity, to create sound? So what you're listening to here now is um, an audio representation where we use um, the, the knowledge of the, of the stresses or forces near crack. Near crack, this is again the picture of the crack, we have the singularity, meaning that the forces become very large as you go closer to the crack tip. And the way we sonify this, the way we make it audible, is in the following way. We use a sine wave um, or a sound signal, and we have the initial sound signal which reflects the undeformed state between atoms, so basically having an equilibrium. Imagine, remember we had in the beginning, we talked about atoms being connected by springs. So these springs kind of actually look like sine waves, um, but this is an actual sine wave playing. And um, we then have um, forces acting on the atoms, right? So just like in atoms, if the forces are compressive, the atoms are going to be squeezed together. And if the forces are are a tensile, the atoms are going to be pulled apart. And we're doing the same thing for the sine waves. And what you hear in the audio is me moving around in the space around the crack. So I'm basically moving around near the singularity. And as I get closer to the crack tip, um, the sound is going to be distorted because I'm playing an original sine wave and I'm playing a sine wave that's slightly elongated or slightly compressed. And that gives a very unique um, audible signal, very unique audible information that you can hear in the background. And this is yet another kind of music instrument you can use. And it's a way of understanding what it means to be near singularity. And it means you as a human can actually begin to experience the stresses and forces near a moving crack.